Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired Podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Well, hello, my friends. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. You know, one of my favorite expressions is this. You can't always choose the path that you walk in life, but you can always choose the manner in which you walk it. We can determine, in other words, how we make our life live forward, regardless of the experiences we've been through in the past. And I can think of few better examples of this, of someone who models out this quote beautifully in their lives than our guest today. When I invited Rebecca Gregory to join us, I thought we would be chatting primarily about the Boston bombing. I thought we'd be chatting primarily about her losing a leg. I thought we'd be talking primarily about walking forward into life. And then I started learning about her story. I started hearing about what she went through as a child, what she went through even before the bombing, what she's been through since. And it is a story of resiliency. It's a story of faithfulness. It's a story of vibrant living. It's a story, I think, in our community, we need, a, we need a healthy dose of today. So my friends, I don't know if you are poolside, if you are at the office, if you're homeschooling your kids right now, if you're taking the dog for a walk, or if you're working out somewhere, but I challenge you right now to buckle up, get ready for a ride, get ready for a joyful walk, get ready for a, an experience that's going to teach you an awful lot, not only about going through adversity, but coming through it stronger. So I want to introduce you to my friend, and now yours, Rebecca Gregory. Re Rebecca, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thank you so much. It is an absolute honor, John, to be with you guys today. Well, it's our pleasure to have you on. As you just heard me say, I thought we were going to begin in 2013 not up in Boston. And instead, man, I think your childhood has an awful lot to teach us about the woman you have become in time. So take us way back to you growing up. Yeah, it's interesting because everyone automatically associates the bombing with the biggest story of my life, but I think my story really began as a child. I grew up as a preacher's daughter. My dad was an evangelist. He traveled all over the world preaching, but he would come back home and be very abusive to my mom and I. And so from a very young age, I had a lot of trauma incorporated in my life. And then it became one of those things where my entire world was just sinking or swimming. And I had to choose every day, was I going to fight through this for something bigger and better, perhaps more purpose, or was I going to succumb to the talk with my dad about not being good enough. You know, the last thing that he ever said to me, my biological father, was that I would never be good enough for anyone or anything. So when you hear that at 11 years old, it really sticks with you. And I think a lot of things in my life, I've carried that with me and I've had to overcome even now as an adult. Rebecca, I grew up in a pristine family just a, a mom who was the, 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 just a beautiful mom and remained so. A father who worked, but not too much, who loved, but not too much, who, I don't think I ever heard my dad curse. And I think I took that for granted until I grew much wiser in life, recognizing how privileged, how privileged and how blessed I was. At what age were you when you realized that this upbringing, this, this father of yours in particular, this preacher who is so respected in the community, and so miserable at home. When did you realize that this is not right? I think it was a pretty young age for me to realize that. I just remember sitting in the front row of church because he led a church in our community and we were all dressed up. I had two younger sisters and we had our matching dresses and our bows and everyone was always excited to see us. And we would sit on this pew and just look at this man who everyone adored. And the, as soon as the church doors would close, it would be a totally different story. And I, I remember my mom being so opposite of that. And so her and her grace for the situation and just her strength and courage made me realize that it wasn't normal. But I also knew that she was going to protect us at all costs. And that's exactly what she did. Tell me about that. My mom left my biological father when I was still pretty young, and I'm so grateful for that because she really saw that 
it was just getting a lot worse. And I know that it was so difficult for her to do having to leave a man that was so adored in the community and a pastor and all of these different things that he shouldn't have had the title of. And it's interesting because my mom later on went and met another man who I now call my dad, who is my dad, who got to be with me for prom pictures and graduation and when my kids were born. And so he really was the father that I never had. And it was, it was a second chance. So your, your mother makes that decision, but as a young lady, you still have to figure out how do I grow into this person that I am when my biological father, and sometimes it feels like the world is telling me that I'll never be good enough. Rebecca, how do you begin moving forward as an adolescent, becoming the woman that you'll become in time, but going through some of the ups and downs along the way? That part is quite humorous because I remember specifically middle school and high school. I was very awkward, I was shy, and I was scared of people because of everything I was experiencing at home. And even after we had gotten out of the situation, after we no longer saw my biological father, those memories and everything that he instilled in me was still there. And I remember specifically that I hated my legs and my feet because I thought that they were too big and bulky and I was too tall. I'm five, eight and a half, so I'm pretty tall for a woman. And I just remember being so hard on myself. And now I'm like, are you kidding me? Now I don't even have one of my legs in my foot and I'm wishing every day I could have it back. <laughs> How would you have masked up? Because you write in the book and you share in some of your talks that I've been able to listen to about wearing a mask about wearing a mask and, and not being authentic with who you really were and who you really are. What, what kind of mask would you have put on back then? I called it my obedient preacher's daughter mask. And I wore that mask for a very long time because I was everything that everyone else wanted me to be. And I was that for longer than I really care to think about because my main priority, my main goal was always making everyone else around me happy. And if they weren't happy, then there's no way that I could be happy. And what I didn't understand at that time and moving forward was that I was not going to make anyone else happy unless I was content and comfortable with myself. Well, there's a, a turning point in your life coming in a mighty way that no one can see coming in the short term, but it's going to radically change your life. April 15, 2013, you're in Boston. What were you doing up in Boston? Celebrating my birthday weekend. I had just turned 26 years old and the guy that I was dating at the time, his mom had qualified to run the Boston Marathon. I had never been to Boston before. We were just catching a Red Sox game and touring the city and I had brought my five-year-old son along with me. We were all packed up, ready to go home as soon as the marathon concluded on Monday. I understand that you were watching this marathon and for those of us who've ever witnessed a marathon, it's not like the Boston Red Sox game where you sit in section 117, row four, and you just sit there for the entire nine innings. At a marathon, you're moving, and you're moving, and you're moving, and you come to a place where you, you know, maybe the race is over. And then a friend of yours says, you know, let's go to the finish line. Let, let, let's, let's watch our friend finish strong. We know now listening to this broadcast where this story is going to go next. How frequently, though, do you go back to that moment and second guess yourself and second guess that conversation and second guess that decision to move where you went next. Well, I think intuition is a very big thing that we don't listen to enough sometimes. And I had every red flag I could think of as to not go on that trip at all. And the night before, I was working at a, a corporate housing firm, and I had this huge quota to meet and all of these different things to get done. And I was at the office until at least 9, maybe 10 o'clock that night, and I was supposed to get on a plane the next day at about 6 a.m. So I already knew this was a bad idea. And then someone in our group of about nine said, hey, let's make our way closer to the finish line so that we can actually see our runner cross. And so we did that. And like you said, it's not like you're sitting down, you are constantly moving. We were tracking our runner on an app on our phones right. and getting through the crowd. I, you know, I had my five-year-old son with me. So now I'm trying not to let him get lost in this enormous crowd. I'm pushing my way through and I'm basically running the same marathon that I'm trying to watch 
watch trying to keep up with our runner. But we were right in the middle of all of the action and we had a great spot right there at the finish. You had a great spot, but not everybody felt that way. You had five-year-olds and apparently five-year-olds don't like walking marathons. And no. so Noah's <laughs> getting a little edgy and uh, you give them some advice that may have changed both of your lives. Why don't you tell our listeners and our viewers um, what you told him to do? Honestly, I was trying to entertain my son. He was pulling on my clothes and saying, mom, mom, when are we going to leave, mom? And I'm trying to watch our runner. And I said, buddy, why don't you sit down on my feet and play in the rocks like you're a scientist? And there were no rocks. We were on asphalt. But to a five-year-old, that was a cool thing to do. And so Noah took his place on my feet with his back up against my shins. And that's exactly where my little boy was when a bomb in a backpack went off three feet behind us. Rebecca, we've all seen pictures. We've seen video, some with sound, some without sound. We get a sense for the chaos from 100 feet away. I believe you were three feet away from that explosion. Is that right? I was, yes. It, it's a perspective that is indescribable, but I'd still love for you to share with us what it, what it was you felt and what it was you heard and, and what you thought had happened. Yeah, I didn't really know what had happened at the time, but I knew that by panning the scene around me, it was something so evil and horrific. So we never lost consciousness that day. And I remember being kind of thrown and only able to move my head around. And so I was panning, searching for my son first off, and I could see people's body parts that were no longer attached to them them, nails, BBs, ball bearings, everything that these brothers packed into these pressure cooker bombs. And then I looked down at my own body and my legs and I saw my bones laying next to me on the sidewalk. I'm in a pool of my own blood and I'm just thinking, looking up at the sky going, this is it. This is how I'm going to die. And all I want to know is if my son is okay. So you start reaching for your son and you start listening for your son. Take us forward from there. I shouldn't have been able to hear as clearly as I did because my eardrums had been blown out, but I could very clearly hear a little boy, my son, calling mommy, 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 just frantically screaming. And I looked over and he was in the arms of a police officer. And I saw that he had a cut on his leg, but he was nowhere injured to the extent that I was. And it was such an amazing moment for me. And I call it a miracle because now, there's no rhyme or reason as to why my son is here and thriving other than it wasn't his time yet and there's a bigger plan for his life. But I knew then that I felt like I was really going to die because that was my confirmation of kind of the deal that I had just made. Let me know Noah's okay and, and I'll be all right. So now that you know Noah is in the arms of a police officer and he's safe and he's relatively physically fine, now it's you. Not now you have to be thinking about yourself. What goes through the mind of a 26-year-old girl celebrating a birthday weekend at, in Boston at the finish line of the marathon when she recognizes this might be it? I didn't want it to be it. I knew that I had not lived my life in the way that I wanted to die in. And not that I had intentionally taken things for granted, but I look back and I think about the 26 years of my life that I expected to just get out of bed and put two feet on the ground. And I was looking at all of these different images flashed before me and I just knew I wasn't done yet. I wasn't done being a mom and I wasn't done with whatever my purpose was going to be in this world. And I knew that I just had to fight. Well, you begin that fight and it is going to be far greater than a marathon length and fight. I think you spend 57 days in hospital. Is that right? 56 days. Yeah. Six days in hospital. To just slow it down for us a little bit. You, you eventually get raced to the hospital. Do you remember the emergency room? Do you remember coming into the hospital the first day? 
Unfortunately, I remember all of it, and that's the hardest part. It's it's just the experience in itself. It was more pain than I've ever been in. I remember the ambulance ride to the hospital and just begging them to put me to sleep because I couldn't endure any more pain. And I remember getting to surgery, and they were putting me into an emergency surgery, and the lady was asking me, please just give me a phone number of someone to call. And I was trying so hard to get my mom's number out, and it was just like the most difficult thing I could ever do. And finally I did. And it was just, that was it for me. I just had to say, okay, I'm, I'm done fighting. We'll see what happens from here. Looking back on that, was the pain that you were experiencing more physical, spiritual, emotional? Were you just longing for your son? Were you wondering if it was, was going to be okay? Like what, what were some of the thoughts and emotions racing through your mind? I think all of those emotions at once. I was obviously worried about my son. They took me to a separate hospital than he was in. But the amazing part about that is I was placed into a medically induced coma for the first couple of days. And about the fifth day was when I was really coming to and hearing that I was involved in a terrorist attack and all of these crazy things you think you're never gonna hear in your life. And about that time when I was waking up and worrying about where Noah was, he was coming to my hospital to visit me. And that was just a really wonderful thing and a great reminder right off the bat that even though these doctors are coming in and giving me terrible news, at first I was supposed to lose both my legs and my left hand. And I said, no matter what, My legs are not my life. This is not my life. My life is what I make it going forward. And this little boy needs his mom and I'm gonna do whatever it takes to give him that. Take us through some of the treatment that you received while you were in hospital. 56 days of continuous surgery every other day. I had developed osteomyelitis, an infection that nearly took my leg then. And the doctors just kept saying, We don't know if you're going to lose your leg or not. We're going to try to save your right leg, but your left leg is really in question. I looked like a shark's leftover lunch. I had 80% of the muscle taken out of my uh, foot and ankle and the bones and all the surrounding tissue. And I just had chunks blown through my leg. I had a chunk blown completely through my left foot. You could see through my foot. And it was just... I was, I was being pieced back together day by day. Doctors were coming in, removing pieces of shrapnel with different tweezers. And it was the most horrifying experience of my entire life. And it went on for almost two months. You're young. <laughs> you know, when, you're, when you're five, when you're Noah's age and you look at mom, she's extremely old. She's ancient. She's 26 after all. But when you're the one who's 26, you're just a baby. You're not mature. You're not really, truly ready for this. So what gets you through that time in hospital? I think a lot of different things. I had faith that if I was here, then it meant I was here for a purpose. And I didn't know what that purpose was or how to even figure it out. But I knew that I had to keep going, that I was surviving for a bigger reason. My support system was incredible. I had a mom that never left my side for 56 days. She stayed with me. And then a year and a half after, when I was continuing with surgeries and all of these different contraptions like external fixators and having to move back into her house instead of going home to my own home, it's just, those are the people that when we're too weak to really do anything ourselves, we rely on. I relied on the people that loved me and surrounded me with that support. So for me, recovering mom was a huge part and family was a huge part, but there were also some surprising staff members, um, a janitor yeah. named Lavelle, a CNA named Roy, a, a, a wonderful RN named Sue. Was there one hospital leader at any level throughout the organization that just came into your life right on time that really guided you forward into this this journey that you continue? 
Oh, definitely. I had three nurses in particular, Naomi, Tracy, and Helen, and they all brought different types of spice to the day. And I had a doctor, a surgeon that called me his Southern Bell and a nurse practitioner, Megan. And I, I look back and it's those little things, you know, for, for instance, one person brought me chicken noodle soup one day because they knew I was tired of the hospital food or find the basin, the one basin that you could wash your hair in because I have very long hair. I had long hair then and they wanted to make me feel like a human. And so they would search down this basin so that they could wash my hair for me and just make me feel a little bit more like myself. Those are the people that get you through stuff. That's right. Rebecca, for me, coming home from the hospital was a memory that I'll never forget and I'm grateful for it. And it was all good. It was all positive. I assumed in learning your story, you'd have a similar experience and instead it was very different than mine. Take our viewers and listeners through that path of leaving the hospital and eventually making your way home. What were, what were you thinking? What was going through your mind? So I hadn't realized that a big thing had not set in for me yet that was going to be the biggest monster that I had to battle, and that was post-traumatic stress. And in the hospital, I feel like I was confined to these four blank walls, and I had the security of the doctors and the nurses and my family surrounding me. But when they wheeled me to the car in my wheelchair and put me into my mom's van, on the way home, I felt like every single person was going to attack us and we were not going to get home safe. And then it wasn't until I got there and they were wheeling me into the house that Noah ran up to me at five years old and said, don't worry, mom, we're never leaving this house again. And so what I saw was as sweet as that was, he wanted to protect me. I saw that his innocence was gone. At five years old, he had seen something that I wouldn't wish on anyone. And I didn't know how either of us were going to cope because of the fear that I had inside me that I had never felt like that before. So, I mean, it's almost like when I was little, we had these books where you get to pick your path forward. And depending on which one you choose, you turn to a different page. And right now, as I'm seated across from you, I'm, I'm wondering, does it make more sense to continue forward onto the page where we talk about the physical recovery or the emotional? But I, I think we're going to lean toward the emotional because it's one that the majority of us would benefit from experiencing as we grow from your experience. So PTSD. It's something that not only do the folks coming back from war experience and those who've been through traumatic things as children or in their later life, but you went through this yourself, of course. Talk about that therapy. And, and interesting enough, one of the very first things that your therapist challenged you to begin embracing. It was a lot to handle. I had been in the hospital for 56 days. At this time, I'd had all these infections, but were still able to keep my left leg moving forward. I knew that I was going to have a ton of surgeries in my future. I knew I was nowhere near walking or doing any of the things that I would normally do. But the biggest problem was the emotional. It was everything that we saw and experienced that day. It was nothing short of a war scene. And those images are something that you cannot get out of your head. And so I was having nightmares every single night. I was staying up till all hours, basically developing a type of insomnia because I was so scared to lay my head down because I knew what was waiting for me in my dreams. And my son was experiencing those things. He wouldn't get back on his bike. He didn't want to go to school. He didn't want to interact with the world. And what we saw is that PTSD comes in all forms. But amazingly enough, when I was searching for our own answers and what I wanted help you know, for my child and for me and to get on with our lives, I saw how many children and families were suffering with their own traumatic experiences and not being afforded the mental health treatment that Noah and I were. And what that meant is eventually becoming one of the greatest purposes of my life, I think. We'll get there, trust me. <laughs> one of the things I found so moving was rather than begin in uh, April of 2013, you had to begin unpacking your childhood. You had to begin at the very beginning to, to, to completely re-pour the foundation of your life. Talk about that. Why does that matter? 
It matters because everything that we experience throughout our lives is a direct indication of our childhood. So for me, I look back at relationships and things that I probably shouldn't have done and situations that I put myself in that could have been different. And it all stemmed back to how I was treated as a child by my biological father. And I really became interested in it and just started researching and reaching out to very prominent psychologists and doctors and I just wanted to know more and more about how our minds work and how moving forward from childhood to adulthood is so serious. It's such a serious thing because if you're not getting the treatment that you need to get over some of these experiences and trauma, then you can turn to substance abuse or violence or bad relationships or whatever it may be. And so it became very interesting to me and kind of part of my survival mode. It, it took my mind off of things. Off of things, including the physical trauma that you are enduring every day. I think a lot of folks probably assume, Rebecca, when you leave hospital, you made it home. Like, boom, you're done, baby. And yet for you, uh, it was just the start. And 18 months, I believe, after the explosion, yes. you make a decision that, again, is going to change your life. It's going to set you free, but it's going to change your life. T talk about that decision. Yeah. When I came home from the hospital, I was 79 pounds. And to be five, eight and a half, that is very, very underweight. I looked like a patient that was getting sent home to die. And I had to really make some decisions. I felt like the doctor had my best interest at heart when they wanted to continue surgeries and different things to try and get my strength back and walking on my leg and trying to piece me back together. But ultimately, I feel like in life we have decisions that we have to make. And some of those decisions are really tough and they get you out of your comfort zone. For me, I had to decide that I was gonna cut out what was holding me back. I called it a bad boyfriend that I needed to get it out of my life for good. And so I went in on a Friday and I told my doctor I was ready to amputate. And he told me that we should have done this sooner. And he said, when, when do you wanna do this? And I said, you got anything Monday morning? And he's like, really? And usually it's a process because they send you to have an evaluation done to make sure that you're mentally prepared for amputation and all that comes with it. And he said, Rebecca, you're as ready as you're ever going to be. And that weekend, we had a going away party for my leg. We had fun with it. I did one last back Boston Strong pedicure. And on that Monday morning, we sent that bad boyfriend right out the door. <laughs> So you say that it's such a, an honest, almost jovial manner, like carefree. I would imagine, Rebecca, that th there's just some pain. I, I, and I know it's such a fear. I know it has ultimately liberated you to walk forward into life. It, yeah, you had to go through this. But still, but still. Uh, what is it like going to bed on a Sunday night? looking down, seeing, you know, in, in sheets, you see one little thing on the right, that's your right foot on the left, there's a left foot. And you know, it's broken, you know, it's painful, but it's still your foot, man. What is it like knowing that you'll never again go to bed with that left foot part of your body? I don't think it's anything that I ever processed fully because it's nothing you can prepare for. Now, you, as a child, you think that you're just supposed to be normal. And then different things happen to you, which you're well aware of. And it turns your entire world upside down and life blows up in your face. And then you have to just pick up the pieces as best as you can. I knew for me moving forward, it was not going to be easy, but I wanted to walk. I wanted to do everything on a fake leg that I didn't do on two real ones. Mm -hmm. And this really made me appreciate life in a way that I never had before. Before. And so it's a daily reminder of how short life is. And that's what you have to focus on. We can spend all day talking about problems, but my blessings outweigh that. And so do everyone's. While you're going through this painful process, 18 months after this all begins, after 17 surgeries and 65 procedures, I believe the FBI come into your life and they say, oh, by the way, we're going to need you to testify. Yeah. Talk about the conversation. Now, I'd like to ask you some questions around preparing for that in the courtroom itself. So it's interesting because the FBI came to my rehab room. So I got my leg cut off 
and spent a couple days in the hospital and then they wanted me to go to a rehabilitation center. About the second day that I was there, the FBI came in and the US attorney and they said, hey, by the way, we know that you just had your leg amputated, but we're gonna need you to testify in the trial of the remaining bomber. And I had become pretty close with them. So it was, you know, they, they were obviously very caring about it. And I was like, oh my goodness. But to wrap my head around the fact that this had happened and then to have to go back to court and stare down the biggest enemy of my life was something I just couldn't fathom. I couldn't comprehend. And I said, there's no way. I, I can't do this. I am emotionally fried at this point, and I, I want no part of it. And I really started to think about it because I didn't have that decision that I could make. And I said, you know, if my testimony can help the jury or the judge in their final verdict, if I can do something with that, then it's my responsibility to show up in that courtroom and tell my story. And so I prepared for Boston and I went in and I gave the hardest testimony of my entire life. I sat maybe five feet away from the remaining brother and it was so difficult. But the amazing part was, is that I got to go back to Boston and give a victim impact statement. And that's what really, I think, closed that chapter and began a whole new Rebecca. Well, let's talk about that new Rebecca. It does, to me, seem like an inflection point when you are no longer chained to someone else's decisions to try to steal your life, steal your joy, steal your faith, steal your freedoms. But you claim victory over that. So talk, talk about standing up and, um, and reading that victim impact statement. And by the way, I know... You, you have all, you refuse to call yourself a victim. So even referring to that statement as a victim impact statement, it's probably hard for you to do. You're a victor over this experience, but talk about that statement and what you read. What was the essence of that statement? Well, I had to Google what a victim impact statement was because I had never been part of a federal trial before. Right. So then I understood it better. I, I saw that it was the last statement that the jury and judge would receive before making the final verdict. And I knew that I was going to stand up in front of the biggest enemy of my life. And I would either rehash all the horrible things that had happened to me, or I would spin it around and create a new little narrative and say, guess what? You didn't defeat me. And so I turned my statement in to the U.S. attorney and he made me go last out of about 22 people. And I got up and I said, I was asked to give a victim impact statement today, but in order to do that, I would have to be someone's victim. And I'm not yours and I'm not your brothers. And I went on to say that one act of hate that stretched a couple hundred feet, we've seen an act of love that stretched hundreds of thousands of miles. And I made a promise to him, looking him straight in the eyes, and I said, I am going to use the rest of my life to do my part in making this world a better place. And I really hold true to that promise. Every day I think about that. And every day that I want to give up or I have another surgery looming overhead or I'm just exhausted because being an amputee is not fun, I, I think about that statement and I think about that promise that I made and I will never go back on that promise. So, dude, I, I've read that statement that you read uh, 10 times, a couple times <laughs> even before I knew I'd meet you, and then probably eight times in preparing for today's interview. Every time I get goosebumps, I've heard it on YouTube a couple times, and then hearing you say right there, goosebumps again. So that's me, and I think that's an ordinary human being with a pulse. If you, if you hear what you just shared, Rebecca, without being moved, it's only because you have no heart. So here's my question. In sharing your victim impact statement, with the attacker could you tell that the the message was being received even if it wasn't physically being uh reciprocated could you tell that at least he was receiving the heart of what you were saying i do think it was received because he would never look at me during my testimony but he never took his eyes off me during my victim impact statement and i had memorized that thing i got up there and it was so crazy because as a people pleaser as this self-conscious human being my entire life i got up in front of him and said look buddy you didn't win and i think there's a part of it where i even said 
you're flipping off the camera in jail, but that's what we're doing to you every time we succeed, <laughs> bank lens or not. And I couldn't believe that that came out of my mouth because it was just so unlike me, but it was me. It was all of this built up aggression almost for everything that had happened. And I just wanted him to know that he didn't defeat me. Well, as if to uh, put a bow on that, you do in Boston, not long after that, when you cross another finish line. Talk about your run with artist Thompson III. It was really clear to me that in order for me to really accept being an amputee, going on in this new life, I was going to use it as a mark of survival and nothing else. And every day I put my leg on, that's what I use it for. And so I wanted to start doing things that I had never even thought of doing on two real legs. I decided I was going to do everything possible. And one of those things that I really wanted to do was cross the Boston Marathon finish line. And I had my amputation in November of 2014. And in January, I got my new leg, which I named Felicia. And we kind of became this thing. I mean, she was a new member of my family. And if I was going to go on in life, I had to have her with me. And so I began this process of not only learning how to walk again, but I wanted to learn how to run. And so I would go to the gym six days a week and train with my trainer. And I would go to the mall and watch other people walk and mimic their steps so that if I had jeans on, you'd never be able to tell that I was an amputee. And it all came to the moment where I wanted to run in the marathon. And I had proclaimed it on Facebook. And you know, if you do that, you can't go back. But a couple weeks before, I had injured my leg pretty badly. I'd gotten up to 16 miles and I took my leg off and it was just busted open and bleeding at the end of it. And so my goal was to run the full thing and I could only run the last 3.2 miles. But that was so significant in my life because 3.2 meant the number of miles that I earned months that I not only learned how to walk again, but how to run. And when I crossed the finish line, it was more about telling myself that I could do it, having the bravery mm -hmm. to go back to Boston and, and do this. It's awesome. And it's just one more finish line. Talk about Rebecca's Angels. So Rebecca's Angels is our nonprofit that we created based on the most terrible days of our lives. We provide mental health treatment to children and families that have experienced trauma. We use a process called accelerated resolution therapy that reprocesses your most traumatic memories. And my son and I have both gone through it and it changed our entire worlds so much so that I went back to Boston last year for the six year anniversary and I wrote a new story. I did everything I did in 2013 again, but this time it was a beautiful experience and we stood in the same spots in the same times and really just had an amazing time watching our charity team run across the finish. And it was a full circle moment. And that's what I want people to know and take away from what I, my story and anything that I say. I want to give people hope because we all go through stuff and everyone's life blows up in their face. Between COVID-19 and what is happening right now in our communities around St. Louis, Missouri, where I live and around the United States and really around the world, it's so divided. There's so much animosity, so many injustices and so many people who feel as if there's no reason for hope, Rebecca. There's just no reason for it. It's just all despair. It's all headwind. It's all bad. What would you say to an individual who feels as if their best days are behind them and there's just, there's just no real rational reason to get out of bed and keep moving forward? Because there's still so much more good in this world and it is our responsibility now more than ever to be a part of that good. I look back on the day in Boston and I could very easily concentrate on all the horrific details, but I choose to see the first responders and the innocent civilians that rushed in to save us, not knowing if a third or a fourth or a fifth bomb was getting ready to go off. And I have seen that support from millions of people across the world, this entire seven year journey. And so it's our responsibility. And sometimes the worst chapters of our lives can lead us to the best ones of all. But we have to make it a point to count those blessings and not the problems and believe that this is temporary.
it's such a powerful message in any given set of circumstances, but in particular, the one that we currently are living in. So I, I just want to thank you for sharing part of your story. And uh, Rebecca, you may or may not know, but every one of our guests is asked seven questions as they get ready to grab their life and dance forward toward their finish line or really their starting line. So question number one for you, Rebecca Gregory, is what is the best book you have ever read? I need to say yours, right? <laughs> if you don't mind. But, right? That's what we agreed to before we recorded. Yes. Um, the Happiness Advantage, I absolutely love because I, I love psychology and happiness is a choice that we have every single day. And it's not because our lives are perfect, but it's that we see the beauty in them. And the more we concentrate on the positive, then it is more easy to spot the positive things in our lives. So that's definitely my favorite. That's a great book and a great man who wrote it. The, the, uh, the idea of whatever you focus on grows yes. is so important. And in particular, when most of us are only focusing on the bad stuff. And mm -hmm. social media is doing a phenomenal job of this and mainstream media on both sides of the aisle are doing a phenomenal job of pointing out all the bad. And that's well before the current events. It just, they, they do a phenomenal job telling us how lousy life is more at 10. So I, I, I appreciate you reminding us that life indeed is sacred and it is good and the foundation is firm. Question number two, what is one positive character, characteristic, one trait that you possessed as a little girl that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? As a little girl, I was a lot more shy and timid. And with being so extroverted now and vocal, I think some of that is lost a little bit. And there's some times where I just wanna go back to my little tree and read my book and write my stories that got me through things and just really appreciate those moments because those are the times that really I was growing without even understanding why. Mm. Man, that idea of slowing down is, yeah so required and the little ones in us all know it and then as we age we think the faster we run the more effective we are and that's usually not the case yes absolutely rebecca if, you, if your home caught fire and your spouse and your babies are all safely out and you have an opportunity to run in and you will run because that's you you will run in and grab one thing what's that yes. one thing that you would come running back outside with I would come running back outside with my water leg. Her name is Ariel and she is very important to me because I am a beach girl. There is nothing that sets my soul more on fire than going to the beach and digging my five toes in the sand. So I would have to come get her. <laughs> and you said her, is her name Ariel? Ariel, yes. Can you sing? Are you more effective at singing when you put Ariel on? I, I do sing that song quite often, and my four-year-old <laughs> daughter loves Ariel, so that's a lot of fun for her, too. <laughs> so does mine. If, if we weren't recording right now, I, you and I could go back and forth doing lines from The Little Mermaid. But I, I think <laughs> we're trying to hold on to our audience, not kick them to the curb, so let's hold on to a little <laughs> uh, If you could sit on a bench overlooking a beach on a perfect day and have a long conversation with anybody, living or dead, who would you want to be seated right next to? Oh my goodness. That would be so tough. Um, oh, there's so many. I, you know, I honestly would just love to sit on any beach with my grandfather. My granddaddy, my mom's mom, w growing up, he was my hero. He was the closest thing I had to a dad. He taught me so many things. He was a pilot and he had a little plane he would always take me up in and he would make me walk around the plane with him and check to make sure everything was working properly. And I take those lessons from him in every single time in my life since. Mm. And I, I lost him several years ago now, and I would give anything to sit on that bench with him. That's awesome. What was grandpa's name? David. David. What's yes. the best advice that David or anyone else ever gave you? 
The best advice I think is to ride in someone else's wake and never be the smartest person in the room. We can all learn things from everyone we meet. And when we stop learning, then we stop growing. And so I want to learn as much as I can and just soak up as much wisdom as possible because there's a lot out there that people are willing to give. And I think just sharing our stories and being vulnerable and able to grow and learn is the most important thing we can do. What would you tell your 20 year old self? And for all of us, it's a, it's a, I think it's an intriguing question, but in particular, six years before a life changing experience, what would you tell that young 20 year old? tell my 20 year old self not to take things seriously go out dancing every single night and completely live it up because i miss those days i don't get to wear high heels anymore and it's it's a change you know i will always be the the spectacle on the beach that all the kids look at and it it takes a lot of self acceptance and confidence that i didn't have before this so i've really had to learn but I would just tell my 20 year old self to not get caught up in all the trivial stuff and to really enjoy life. So I'm going to ask you a question. Six point B most, uh, most of our guests aren't lucky enough to be asked this, but I think it applies really to you because it applies to so many of our listeners, including the one asking the question, how has this experience changed your sense of body image? So at 26, you saw yourself and you understood what beauty was when you looked in the mirror on the day before the bombing. And as you look in the mirror today, uh, how has this experience changed the way you understand what real beauty is? It's completely changed it. I have scars all over my body I've, where they did skin grafts and obviously I'm missing half of my leg. And I've really had to come to a self-acceptance like I never have before because there's always going to be stairs when I have shorts on. The beach I've mentioned is especially entertaining because some kids do freak out and I want to wear shorts and I want to expose my leg as much as possible because I don't want anyone to be afraid to ask me questions. Right. And it's really made me grow in everything and it also makes me want to tell the young women out there and anyone else men too that are struggling with body image it's a big thing and i think society wants you to be a certain way but there's this inclusion part that we're finally getting around to that you're uniquely and wonderfully made and there's no one like you rebecca gregory it has been said that all great marathon runners authors ladies mothers daughters people can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like your one sentence to read? My one sentence is that life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And sometimes you have to go through some really horrific things, but I'm always going to be waiting at the finish line and I can't wait to meet you there. Mm. Rebecca, there was a gentleman in your life at one point who said that you will never amount to anything and that you were unlovable. And I think you have shown this person <laughs> how lovable you are, how accomplished you are, how resilient you are, how faithful you are, how big your God is, and how good life is. I want to thank you for teaching a pastor what life really ought to look like, and I want to thank you for helping our audience to recognize how beautiful their lives are, too. Thank you so much. It's, it's such an honor, and I'm humbled every day. I feel like I was given this platform to be able to witness, and that's what I hope to do. We all have our different ways that we can change the world. I'm just trying to do my part. Thank you for what you do. My friends, that is Rebecca Gregory doing her part to change the world. My name is John O'Leary doing my part, and this is your day to do, to do yours. So this is your opportunity to, uh, to look up, to give thanks, to be grateful for what you have, and to recognize your best days even still remain in front of you. So for this time, and until next time, this is John O'Leary, and today is your day. Live inspired.